Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, today's Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine seminar. It's a pleasure for me as the director to uh, uh, provide a few opening remarks before our speakers introduced by our colleague Jason Kaelberg. Uh, a shameless plug for my own lecture coming up on the 8th of November uh, and additional lectures, additional IQB seminars on November 15, November 29, and December 13. Uh, I point out that December 13 will be given by another uh, member of the um, of the Institute, uh, Anders Larsson, who is the CEO of Renew CO2 Incorporated, which occupied part of the third floor for quite a while. They've been very successful in their um, engineering project to pull carbon out of the air and turn carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into fuel. And he's now got lots of money from Gates and venture capitalists, et cetera, and is moving to a bigger uh, facility that we are, we're not able to accommodate. So he's one of our successful graduates, shall we say. So please make, make a point of uh, seeing that lecture uh, in addition. I want to remind um, members of the the Institute, uh, particularly graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, that uh, there's an opportunity to apply to, for either nom be nominated for or self-nominate for the 2024 IQB Inclusive Leadership Award, which uh, was awarded in 2023 by our Jennifer to our Jennifer Jiang. And um, I think the closing date for applications is at the end of October. So please uh, uh, either arrange for yourself to be nominated or nominate yourself uh, so you can be in contention. I repeat uh, what I say every week that the RCSB Protein Data Bank is, an exp is in an expansion mode and we are keen to attract the right individuals with the right skill sets in database administration, um, cyber infrastructure DevOps and uh, postdoctoral fellow who with expertise in metalloproteins here at Rutgers. We're also seeking a bioinformatics postdoc at UCSD. There are also gap year opportunities for, for recent undergraduate graduates uh, between BSc and um, medical school, MD, PhD or PhD. And we also of course have our undergraduate summer research activities. Um, so please, um, if any of these appeal to, or if you know someone who you think would be a good candidate for any one of these opportunities, please don't hesitate to um, uh, re to react and, uh, and get on our radar. Uh, so Professor Jason Kaelber is going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much. Well, I'm fortunate to be uh introducing a member of my own laboratory this week and doubly fortunate because I know what's coming in the talk. So I know that uh, that you all will be impressed by the really cool science. So um, let me give you a little background on today's speaker, Dr. Judith Penzesh, uh, a star postdoctoral fellow uh, here at IQB. She obtained her doctorate from the University of Veterinary Medicine in Budapest and then uh, went on around the world to be a postdoctoral fellow at the Institut d'Armand Frappier in Laval with Peter Tyson, and then a further postdoctoral training under the late Professor Mavis Agbanji McKenna at uh, University of Florida, the McKnight Brain Institute, the, the pioneer of AV uh, structural biology. And then, uh, and then she came here to Rutgers. Um, in addition to, or alongside uh, this extensive training, um, her expertise in, in virology has been recognized by membership on the executive committee of the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses. Um, and she also serves as an expert for the World Health Organization on the um, Parvoviridae viral family group, which is a group that convenes experts uh, from around the world to uh, figure out which viruses are gonna cause the next pandemic and how the entire world uh, scientific and political community can, can head that off. So um, alongside that, she's published some, some really stellar research um, 
And rather than, than list off those many papers and achievements, I think I would like to turn it over now so you can see the latest and greatest unpublished research from her work on parvoviruses. Thank you. I don't know my slides. Uh, I'm meeting it and nothing happens. Hmm. And then. Okay, here we go. What is this? Okay. All right, so thank you for the introduction and that um, I have the opportunity to give this talk in here. And with that, um, let's um, start on this interesting journey of uh, farm beetles. Um, virus uh, discovery um, has been revolutionized by a, a metagenomic based approach. However, metagenomics aren't without uh, their pitfalls. If you um, look at this picture on the slide, you can exactly see why. Um, metagenomics uh, relies um, extremely on a homology search and uh, while this way um, uh, finding new species and even identifying new genera is, um, is an easy task, however the number of uh, families and let alone orders didn't increase uh, significantly since the years metagenomics have been so prominent as um, a virus discovery tool. So it raises the question that if we are dealing with um, a, an actual uh, pandemic, an actual disease with an unknown causative agent, is it really metagenomics the right way to um, uh, characterize that? And um, yeah, so um, uh, we suggest an other approach like, could structural biology actually be um, incorporated in this process and uh, use it as a virus discovery, let alone diagnostic tool? Well, in these pictures, um, all three of them were used actually to diagnose um, an outbreak and even uh, an outbreak. Two of these are from my six-legged patients. They are all from common house crickets. First is an irritovirus. The second one is a denzovirus infection. However, the third one is actually from humans. Um, this is actually how uh, the original SARS-CoV um, outbreak uh, was characterized that the coronavirus was a causative agent. But we would like to uh, get further one step, not just using electron microscope micrographs, but actual structures to discover viruses and uh, characterize illnesses. And that's what this story is going to be about, about how we uh, tackled a pandemic that you probably don't even know about. It's going on here in the United States using uh, cryo-EM. So the star of this uh, story is uh, the superworm, which is actually not a worm. It's, um, it's a beetle. It's the larva of a darkling beetle species called uh, Zophobus morio. And together with its very close relative, the mealworm or Tenebrium molitor, they are uh, farmed uh, worldwide as uh, prominently as, as feed for um, uh, prominently as feed for exotic animals, as well as uh, as an alternative protein source uh, for humans. It's a billion dollar um, industry as estimated by the year 2030. And um, these animals are actually rare in these large um, masses um, in very close proximity. So uh, one can see how uh, pathogen getting in there could be a really big issue. They do need to be raised like this, however, because the, the larvae, as they touch each other, they produce juvenile hormone, which prevents them from uh, pupation. Uh, since 2019, anecdotal evidence circulates around the United States of a mysterious superworm disease that uh, created a huge shortage in a shortage in the superworm supply of the nation. In from some pet stores, superworms have basically been completely absent. 
And uh, this illness, um, what it looks like is that it comes with a 90 to 95% mortality in the colony. It mostly affects larvae, but sometimes pupae too. And it results in uh, first the animals start uh, wiggling uncontrollably, then they stiffen, and then they blacken as you can see it in the pictures. So we uh, call this illness um, uh, waste, uh, black wasting disease, uh, Zophobus morio black wasting disease. Um, but it, so when you look at um, healthy superworms, you can see that they immediately start to crawl in all directions, start to hide. However, when they are affected by the black wasting disease initially, they uh, show uh, this uncontrollable locomotion. Uh, it's clear that this animal doesn't have any control over uh, where it wants to go. And so what could be going on? What could be behind uh, the black wasting disease? Well, um, a farmer reached out to us, um, a farmer reached out to us from the state of Utah after suffering a complete colony collapse, um, uh, tell, asking us to help uh, characterize what could be going on with these animals. So a week later, we found four pounds of gooey dead superworms in our mailbox and we actually got to work. Um, so uh, the approach we used was that uh, we grabbed about 30 individual, uh, individuals, homogenized them and fractionated uh, their protein by, uh, a sucro by sucrose cushion and sucrose gradient purification. And we actually got two positive fractions on this sucrose gradient. And upon visualizing uh, by TEM these two um, uh, fractions, we saw that they both contain these icosahedral particles. And both fraction consisted of four protein fractions as uh, characterized uh, by the um, as characterized by the SDS page. Um, if we look at these particles, they, they look quite similar to each other. The only difference is, difference is that the ones in the lower buoyancy fraction uh, are actually more electron dense than the ones in the higher buoyancy fraction. And they all have apparently the same size protein composition. So what we suspected in here that we were actually dealing with um, a virus and these two fractions are actually just a, a virion fraction, which contains genome and an empty fraction, which uh, doesn't have packaged genome inside. So uh, we reconstructed uh, the 3D volume from these micrographs and um, it uh, actually proved our initial hypothesis. Indeed, the ones in the lower fraction were uh, filled with a large amount of density inside, probably corresponding with the genome. And then uh, in order to learn more about this 28 nanometer T equals one icosahedrally symmetric non-enveloped viral particle, uh, we built the density uh, using a polyalanine chain to obtain the structure of the backbone. And uh, when obtaining this backbone structure, we could use this to uh, perform a homology search uh, using the entire protein data bank um, using uh, the DALI algorithm. And uh, DALI uh, gave us significant hits that corresponded exclusively with the Parvoviridae family. And even from there, we'd like an, we'd like a a surprisingly high z-score, uh, we received the three hits um, that corresponded with the three structures in the Densoviridae super family, uh, subfamily of the Parvoviridae. And indeed, if we superimpose this backbone with these three structures, they are really quite similar, having corresponding um, loops as well as uh, an eight-stranded jelly roll core. Um, if we look at the surface morphology of this uh, capsid, um, although it's a, it's a new um, type of surface morphology within the Parvoviridae family, it's still clear that um, it, it has it, it looks 
a lot more similar to those of uh, the surface of denzoviruses as opposed to those in the other three subfamilies of the Parvoviridae. So now we knew that we were most likely dealing with a denzovirus and it was time to name this virus. So we named it Sophobus morio black wasting virus, which I will abbreviate as ZMBWV moving forward and um, after its characteristic pathology. But what are parvoviruses? So parvoviruses are small non-enveloped DNA viruses with a single-stranded linear DNA genome. And uh, they are, it's a highly diverse family infecting uh, metazoan animals as basal as this beadlet and ammoni to up to us primates. And uh, parvoviruses are united despite their diversity by their genome organization. They have this linear single-stranded genome, which at the termini are flanked by uh, these partially double-stranded DNA secondary structures, which can be either inverted terminal repeats or distinct at the genome ends and can, and can have quite varied morphology, yet they are always there as they are um, required for replication. The parvovirus coding region has two major expression cassettes. The NS cassette gives rise to um, the non-structural proteins and uh, includes the only sequentially conserved domain of the entire family, a superfamily three helicase domain or SF3 domain. There is the other expression cassette. The VP cassette gives rise to structural proteins um, uh, yeah, the structure of proteins or VPs, which um, can also include a conserved domain. Um, it's not where I want to go. Um, okay, so the parvovirus capsid is this TQOS1 uh, eicosahedron, which um, is built by 60 identical um, subunits, all of which have an eight stranded jelly roll core and very long surface loops. And then um, 60 of these subunits comprise the capsid shell itself, uh, which uh, has a two-fold symmetry axis where two subunits interact with each other, a three-fold symmetry axis where three subunits come together, and the five-fold symmetry axis, which is the interaction point for five subunits. Uh, the parvoviruses have capsid proteins in a varied number from one up to four. And uh, even in case of uh, multiple capsid proteins, these are just N-terminal extensions of each other sh uh, sharing a C-terminal domain where they all overlap. And this is what comprises the capsid shell itself. However, in this uh, N-terminus, which is uh, disordered, um, there is another conserved domain, which is the phospholipase A2 enzymatic domain, um, which uh, I will just abbreviate as PLA2 from going forward. The parvoviridae uh, currently has four subfamilies. Uh, the densovirinae, which infects exclusively invertebrates, the parvovirinae infecting vertebrates, the metalloinserted parvovirinae, which just got approved this year, which is a monotypic uh, subfamily infecting penoid shrimps, and then the homo parvovirinae infecting both vertebrates and invertebrates. So far, um, only three capsid structures have been resolved in the densovirinae subfamily, as opposed to the over 100 capsid structures in the parvovirinae. Uh, now that we knew we were dealing with a parvovirus, a densovirus to be exactly specific, we could uh, use a genome sequencing approach, which only cost us $15. And um, by this method, which was a commercial Oxford nanopore sequencing platform, we could uh, sequence the entire genome. And how do we know we got the entire genome, which was about 5.5 kilobases in length? from that we actually obtain these uh, uh, hairpin-like structures flanking uh, the genome at both ends. And in the coding region, we identified five open reading frames, which were actually all homologues of uh, their uh, counterparts in the blood and bidenzovirus genome in the denzovirinae. Um, 
we identified this way three non-structural proteins and two uh, structural protein encoding ORFs. There was uh, the conserved SF3 helicase domain in the NS1 and uh, a PLA2 domain in the smaller structured protein coding ORF. Uh, however, the surprise came only now that turns out that this virus is actually not a new virus at all. It has relatives that are like over 90% identical at um, the nucleotide level already deposited in the gene bank. But all of these viruses were actually derived from uh, vertebrate metagenomic assemblies, such as the gut virome of bats, pangolins, um, and birds. Um, so um, this virus had uh, clearly some relatives that could not be linked to uh, any kind of pathogenesis or any host whatsoever. So we were curious that although we found this virus in higher bounds, is it really the causative agent of the black wasting disease? And so to find this out, we embarked on a journey to characterize its uh, pathogenesis. First, we quantified the virus titer at all life stages of these animals, as well as in symptomatic individuals and blackened carcasses. Why this is interesting is that because uh, although the mortality is really high, over 90%, some of these larvae uh, do survive and manage to pupate and then uh, turn into beetles and reproduce. So these were the animals we tested. And what we found that although obviously the blackened carcasses and uh, even some symptomatic individuals had a very high virus yield, it was also quite a high virus yield present in, um, in those uh, newly hatched larvae and even the two week old larvae. Uh, we uh, also uh, used purified ZMBWV, um, ZMBWV to inoculate four week old healthy superworms at five different um, at five different doses. And uh, what we saw that all of these animals uh, actually uh, died within two weeks. It only depended on the viral dose they got when. And uh, when uh, these animals were fed. Uh, using their exploiting their cannibalistic nature by feeding the blackened carcasses to these healthy larvae. We also found that uh, uh, they died only took them twice as long time as the lowest dose in case of uh, the uh, direct fat body injections we saw on the previous slide. We also used another non-invasive method to try to infect them. We dripped the virus suspension in two different doses on directly on the cuticles of these animals. And also in this case, they died in a dosage dependent manner. Uh, at midpoint of this experiment, uh, we uh, assessed the viral titer in um, all of these treatment groups. And uh, what we found that uh, the lowest titer, interestingly, was in those individuals which uh, uh, received the highest uh, dose directly into the fed body. Whereas uh, the highest yield was in case of those which received the virus through the non-invasive methods. There was also um, quite a significant increase in the virus yield in case of um, non-symptomatic individuals between non-symptomatic individuals and when they started exhibiting symptoms. We um, also um, uh, purified the virus, repurified the virus from this treatment group, sequenced this genome, and uh, received back the 100% identical genotype to the one we um, introduced into them. And um, with this, we fulfilled all of Koch's postulates. We can declare that ZMBWV is indeed the um, uh, is indeed the pathogenic agent of uh, the black wasting disease of the superworms. Um, however, it uh, was really interesting to us this sudden tighter increase. Uh, between symptomatic and non-symptomatic individuals. So we were curious what could be the reason for this. And uh, if we observe these individuals as the disease progresses, they start to show a miscolored region on their abdomen, which actually corresponds with the location 
on the mid gut. So what could be going on inside the mid gut? And to answer this question, we process the freshly dead individuals as well as healthy individuals and um, rendered their 3D volume using micro CT after iodine staining. And if we looked inside the mid gut, what we saw that while the organ had a healthy appearance with a thick trophic layer of cells uh, inside, the trophic layer, which consists mostly of columnar cells, was completely gone in case of uh, the freshly diseased individuals. And only these rings of the longitudinal muscles remained in place. And even between those, there were these large penetrations. So what we think is that the virus uh, infects the mid-gut inner layer that replicates for a long time. That's why farmers usually notice the disease only in case of the eight-week-old superworms, because when uh, the mid-gut is finally breached by uh, the virus, then it invades the fat body. And this is what leads to the, sy the systematic symptoms that these animals exhibit. And from then on, the disease progress is fast. Next, we wanted to characterize the epidemiology of ZMBWV. Since we have anecdotal evidence that this is a nationwide uh, pandemic, um, we were curious at its true extent, and we didn't focus our attention exclusively on the superworms. We also turned towards mealworms because these two animals are very closely related and they are usually housed in a, a very similar manner. So, um, uh, so we collected pools of um, animals from multiple farms all over the country, and all of these pools uh, were positive. And uh, what we found that even all of the mealworms for, uh, pools were positive, yet none of these farms declared any problem going on with the mealworms. They all confirmed that production was great and these mealworms didn't exhibit any symptoms. However, they had, when we tested them by qPCR, an extremely high virus yield basically the same uh, yield per individual as we saw in the blackened superworm carcasses, yes, yet they did not exhibit any symptoms. And uh, although uh, all the North American uh, superworm strains, virulent superworm strains were si more similar to each other than the mealworm sequences, interestingly, the mealworm genomes were more similar to those of the metagenomic assemblies as they were to the virulent strains. This was also supported. This was also supported by the phylogenetic reconstructions, where all the American virulent strains clustered as a monophyletic branch. Yet uh, the mealworm strains clustered all over on this tree, actually closer to all of these uh, vertebrate assemblies. There was one exception: a superworm pool from a farm in Florida where the farm didn't uh, experience any of the signs of ZMBWV, yet when uh, their healthy animals arrived at us, it was a very cold day, and these animals started exhibiting symptoms of ZMBWV just in a couple of days. And indeed, we could sequence um, the full genome of this virus of this strain, and uh, it does cluster with the mealworm and metagenomic assemblies. Um, so uh, now that we know that there is such a high variation in virulence between these strains, we were curious that uh, how um, do these uh, work if we cross transmit them between uh, the animals? Could the mealworms be responsible for maintaining this pandemic? Well, um, what we found was that, again, if we inoculate them with the virulent Utah strain, then they all die. But when we inoculated them at the very doses, doses directly into the fat body with a, a non-virulent mealworm strain from New Jersey, what we found was that after a dosage-dependent initial uh, acute toxicity phase, these animals actually kept on surviving and they survived even four, four months following this experiment when we euthanized them finally. Um, in case 
we introduce the, the virus, the virulent Utah strain via feeding, then uh, again, they, um, they die just like in the previous experiment. But when we introduce the with the same method, the New Jersey non-virulent strain, then actually none of these animals died in this study. Um, so um, the next, so it back for the question that if there are strains which are non-virulent in either of these animals, could they provide cross protection against the virulent strains? And uh, to test this, we um, pre-inoculated using our non-virulent New Jersey strain, our uh, healthy superworms, waited three weeks, and then challenged them using the virulent Utah strain. And uh, what we found was that uh, in case of the double inoculated animals, they kept on surviving indeed significantly longer as the pool which only got the virulent strain. So there is indeed uh, some degree of cross protection uh, between these two strains. Our next question was that whether the cross protection is consistent between the non-virulent strains. And the answer is this is it's actually not. There are uh, there is um, in case of no vaccination, um, they they die as the disease progresses within three weeks of time. There was one strain from Oregon which uh, actually accelerated this process and they all already started exhibiting symptoms and dying off throughout the three week initial um, inoculation phase. But most majority of these non-virulent strains indeed provided cross protection against the virulent strain. Now that we characterized uh, the pathogenesis of this virus, established that it was the causative agent of the disease and had the sequence, we could delegate our attention back to the structure itself. And um, our first question was that how many capsid proteins does this virus actually have? Because its closest relative blood telogermonic adenovirus has four capsid proteins. And um, we also found four protein fractions that could potentially be capsid proteins. So we sequenced uh, these four uh, protein bands using tandem mass spectrometry. And what we found that all of them are actually derived from uh, the ZMBWV genome, but uh, only one of these, the small, the largest minor capsid protein, VP1, which contained the PLA2 domain, was uh, incorporated sequences coming from the smaller um, the smaller open reading frame. And this is uh, different from what is in case of blood telogermonic adenovirus, where there are actually two splice transcripts creating minor capsid proteins. So it seems like the way of how these viruses express their capsid proteins is not consistent within the genus. Now we could also uh, model the side chains um, of uh, the side chains of this capsid structure in case of both the virions and the empty capsids and um, properly build uh, our subunit where what we found that the backbone itself was uh, highly similar between the, um, the empty capsids and the genome field virions. And um, various, both of these uh, fractions had um, a disordered N-terminal segment, just like every parvovirus does. That this degree of disorder differed in case of uh, the virions and empty capsids in the way that the virions had an additional six amino acid long ordered region. Uh, so in order to understand the reason for this, we have to look at the multimer interactions of this capsid. And um, to do that, we first have to look at the twofold symmetry axis, which is located in here in the capsid. And at this symmetry axis, there's a fundamental difference in how it's constructed in case of uh, densoviruses and vertebrate infecting parvoviruses in a way that in the vertebrate infecting parvoviruses, uh, the 
and terminal most beta strand, beta A folds back in a hairpin-like loop so it can interact with the beta B subunit of uh, the very same uh, monomer, and hence it creates a weak two-fold interaction. However, in denzoviruses, the beta A is an essential and terminal extension of the beta A strand, so it can interact with the beta B of the two-fold neighboring monomer, and this doesn't only create a strong two-fold interaction, but also an intersubunit beta strand, which provides um, an increased inner surface area to the capsid. And why this is important is that one of the key challenges of a uh, of uh, AAV mediated gene therapy today is the limited packaging capacity of the capsid. There is uh, denzoviruses have overcome this problem, but we could not have overcome. Uh, we could not have overcome uh, uh, so far how to increase uh, the inner volume of the capsid to package larger genomes. In case of CMBWV, we can also um, we can also observe the domain swapped conformation, just like in Galeria melonella denzovirus, which is the type species of the denzovirini. However, when we look at this interaction, what we see is that uh, the beta A interacts with the beta F of the threefold neighboring subunit and not with the two-fold neighboring one. And this interaction happens through uh, hydrophobic interactions, which are in case of um, the empty capsid with the disordered and terminus absent. So what this implies is that uh, this N terminus is not pinned to the capsid inner surface anymore. It can actually freely move inside and uh, it manifests as this large amount of uh, disordered density under the five-fold symmetry axis of the um, empty capsids. Uh, so the reason for this can only be appreciated. However, if we look at the five-fold symmetry axis of uh, these viruses and um, the five-fold symmetry axis in all parvoviruses is covered by a pore-like opening continuing with a channel linking together the um, environment with the capsid lumen. And uh, this channel is also the location where this disordered end terminus can be threaded through and uh, externalized to the capsid surface. And uh, when this externalization happens, it manifests in uh, the structure as density fills up the five-fold channel. And this can happen in both of these uh, parvovirus and denzovirus case when the genome is uh, when a genome is packaged following genome packaging, and um, as well as when the capsid is exposed to declining pH. And the reason for this is that. Uh, the parvovirus is trafficked through the uh, endosomal lysosomal system, and um, as the environment acidifies, they externalize the PLA2 domain, which can um, disrupt the um, lysosome membrane, and hence the particles can uh, traffic towards uh, the nucleus. In case of uh, ZMBWV, however, the dynamics of this externalization were reversed, although density occupies the channel constantly, both in the virions and in the empty capsids, it's a, a lot less density in case of the genome field virions as opposed to the empty capsids. Uh, however, let's not forget that ZMBWV has four capsid proteins, which might have a different dynamic of when their N termini are um, threaded to the capsid surface. So it can very well be that uh, only one capsid protein is externalized in here, varies all of them in case of the empty capsids. Uh, still, these uh, particles, as we saw in our experiment, has a very high uh, acute toxicity, which might be linked to the fact that this one capsid protein externalized in the genome field variants is actually the one that contains the PLA2 domain. Uh, the three-fourth symmetry axis, the last symmetry axis we have to consider is also different uh, in denzoviruses. Well, in fact, in all subfamilies of the parvoviridae, 
uh, as opposed to it is in the parvovirine. In the parvovirine, it's covered by this prominent surface spikes. There is, it's a, it's a large opening uh, comprised by um, comprised by a beta annulus in case of the other subfamilies. And uh, this annulus-like opening is very diverse in case of the denzoviruses. Uh, yet, uh, if uh, we compare the opening in ZMBWV with that of Galeria melonella denzovirus, well, we see that uh, these openings are very similarly sized, the largest so far in the subfamily, and they are also occupied by the very same uh, side chains as opposed to the other members of the subfamily. However, in case of the ZMBWV, we also found a little piece of density in here coordinated by the arginines, and um, which was a, a metal ion. And this ion is uh, absent from GMBWV. A similar ion can be found in case of Peneus monodon metallodenzovirus, another parvovirus. And interestingly, also in a non-related family, the Tombus viridae. And uh, interestingly, Tombus viruses also show a very diverse uh, sequence as well as structure of their beta annuli, except for uh, cucumber necrosis virus, which has the largest annulus and it contains uh, an ion, just like GMDV and ZMBWV being also with the largest annulus uh, in their respective family. However, between uh, ZMBWV and GMDV, if we look at the B-factor maps of their capsids, there's a, a very striking difference in uh, how flexible uh, these regions are. If we look at the ZMBWV capsid, the threefold symmetry axis is actually a rigid structure. The entire capsid is quite a rigid one, with the exception of the five-fold symmetry axis, whereas this area is uh, highly flexible in case of uh, GMDV. We hypothesize that the fact that GMDV doesn't have this ion may be an artifact, just because this is a crystal structure and was exposed to many uh, non-natural environments. Uh, at the threefold symmetry axis, we encountered another interesting phenomenon, a large order of uh, order density under the threefold symmetry axis on the luminal surface. And how to imagine this uh, figure is that if we were standing inside the capsid and would look up towards the threefold symmetry axis, this ordered DNA is what we would see, which is absent from uh, the empty capsids. These um, 17 nucleotides per subunit correspond with one fifth of the genome being ordered. And this is a very large number and absolutely atypical of parvoviruses, which usually only have a couple of nucleotides at most ordered in their um, capsid lumen. However, these 17 nucleotides did not comprise a continuous region of the genome. It was actually three different regions of the genome that come together uh, and interact in here uh, with the, interact in here with each other and the capsid surface to um, so that they become ordered and they interact uh, with each other and the capsid via uh, pi stacking as well as some of them flipped towards, uh, some of these bases flipped towards the luminal surface to occupy negatively charged pockets. And uh, we also observed the canonical Watson and Greek pairing with the two separate regions, as well as um, a non-canonical Hoxtein base pair uh, where the two uh, DNA regions come together. Uh, interestingly, the only other denzovirus which has ordered DNA inside its capsid is uh, Acheta domesticus denzovirus, uh, which has three ordered nucleotides per subunit, and they occupy the exact same uh, region within the capsid lumen as, uh, it, as the large amount of ordered nucleotides in case of ZMBWV. Uh, now that we knew that there were there was a significant difference in virulence and there were many different genotypes, uh, we focused our attention towards uh, capsid uh, 
capsid uh, variability and uh, mapping these uh, polymorphic residues. And uh, to do that, we resolved the capsid structure at two angstrom resolution of uh, the New Jersey monitor strain, which is non-virulent, as well as uh, the Oregon monitor strain, which we saw was mildly virulent compared to uh, our Utah strain. And uh, what we found that actually all polymorphic residues uh, that are in the shell domain of the capsid were actually uh, surface exposed um, surrounding the threefold symmetry axis, the annulus like opening, as well as on the spikes surrounding the fivefold symmetry axis. The latter is especially interesting because this is. Um, this region has been shown in Lepidoptera and Denzoviruses as a tropism determinant. And in case of ZMBWV, the residues in here can be either hydrophobic, mildly hydrophobic, or polar. And um, they comprise a pocket-like uh, feature on the capsid surface, which was actually occupied by some density that we could, could not model using uh, the protein sequence. And um, this density has a branching uh, disposition in case of the virulent uter strain where the pocket is uh, strongly hydrophobic. There is, uh, it loses some of its uh, ordering of the branches in case of uh, the non-virulent New Jersey monitor strain where the pocket is weakly hydrophobic. However, in this case, we could trace the molecule back to be connected to this highly conserved aspergine residue. And hence, we think that what we see in here is a branching glycan due to anglycolization of this conserved residue. This uh, branching glycan was disordered in case of uh, a polar pocket in uh, our mildly virulent Oregon molitor strain, where um, also this lysine residue adapted a double conformation. The significance of N glycolization on the capsid surface is that in order to obtain that, the capsid has to traffic through the Golgi network in order to exit the host cell. So uh, this is very different from what happens in case of most parvoviruses, which just accumulate particles inside uh, the nucleus as they replicate and then eventually lyse the host cell. So the lack of this lysis might be the reason why it takes uh, so long for ZMBWV to actually destroy the meat gut and invade the fat body. So in conclusions of this study, we can say that uh, we discovered the causative agent of a pandemic characterized this pathogenesis, and we even found a method of how we may be able to counteract it, which is uh, actually our provisional patent at this point. And um, we can also say that ZMBWV was discovered exclusively um, using uh, exclusively using cryoEM. Hence, um, cryoEM is indeed suitable as a virus discovery tool as well as a diagnostic tool. Uh, our surprise was that uh, we found viruses like this circulating worldwide, yet only one uh, monophyletic branch has developed this uh, increased virulence. And we could establish a model of pathogenesis when um, the virus enters the midgut via contaminated food, replicates inside the columnar cells, breaches the midgut wall, invades the fat body, and that's what uh, results in uh, and that's what results in the systematic symptoms leading to the animal's uh, death. And um, leading to the animal's death. We also established that ZMBWV indeed caused a nationwide uh, a nationwide uh, pandemic and uh, that um, it circulates um, in uh, also in the mealworm hosts with a very high titer, yet doesn't cause uh, illness. And these mealworm strains do not provide the reservoir for this um, pathogen at this point. Uh, 
Although CMBWV is the first glimpse um, at what a blood thrombidensovirus looks like structurally, its biology is uh, fundamentally different from uh, that what was found in most denzoviruses thus far, as far as uh, a lack of uh, a lytic cycle goes, and um, also that the particles have a high acute toxicity with a constantly uh, externalized uh, and terminus, the phenomenon which has only been seen so far in a, a human parvovirus B19. And in overall, we can uh, say that cryo-EM has sufficiently matured to be an alternative virus discovery and diagnostic tool. And with that, I would like to thank for your attention and all the help I got during this way and contribution. And of course, a big thank for all the farmers with the samples. And this is actually my lizard who's enjoying a super worm treat himself as well. And... The two of us will run microphones around to anyone who has questions so those online can hear. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, may I take the uh, director's prerogative and ask the first question? Of course, Wonderful. Dr. Thank director. You. That was a spectacular and very highly professional talk, Judith. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I was wondering if you see any of the, um, the five or three prime organized regions of the DNA in the, in the, in the density uh, that's abutting the, uh, the the inside of the capsid? No, uh, actually what we see at order density, we are absolutely sure it's not the three prime okay. end or five prime end because we don't see these pools of double-stranded DNA. It, it should be double-stranded. Sure. Yeah. And uh, in other single-stranded DNA viruses, uh, where uh, there are actually longer partially double-stranded regions, uh, you do um, observe these kind of spools. So I think we would see something similar if it okay. was All the right. three or five. Um, how, does the, how does the viral DNA become double-stranded? Oh, it has a, a sequence which, uh, um, which can uh, fold back and create these uh, hairpin-like spools. No, no, I mean, I mean the coding region. Oh, the coding region? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that the that the single stranded DNA doesn't enter the um, does that does that enter the R, the RNA the RNA polymerase directly or is it is it being brought in as a double stranded segment? So it's uh, when the virus enters the host cell and um, and then uh, um, uh, and then uncoats, then uh, the DNA is uh, actually primed by these hairpins at the end, mm -hmm. and um, then it becomes uh, double-stranded first, then it gets trans transcribed, and then uh, while it's being transcribed, it also um, gets uh, replicated by the cell's own DNA polymerase, and uh, its own um, NS protein is responsible for maintaining this replication by constantly inserting this uh, nick where the hairpins end, so that the host cell polymerase will uh, recognize it as DNA damage and keeps replicating, and, and keep replicating it double-stranded. Yeah, yeah. And then it gets... Uh, of course, spliced up by the NS and then stuffed inside, yeah. probably pre-assembled capsids yeah. as far Viruses as- Viruses are just <laughs> so incredibly clever. This is what billions of years of low throughput screening will do for you. <laughs> yeah. um, I had not encountered the term virinae before. Thank you for educating me. <laughs> the subfamily prefix. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, a I, resident I, taxonomist. I'd never, I'd never seen that before. Yeah. And uh, so I had to look it up online and yeah. sure enough, yeah. It was the typo. Not all families yep. have some okay. families, but where they do, they. Greg, do did you have a question? Did, yeah. Wait, I think there might be one up here first. Did you Did you want to ask the question you had? Okay, give it to Nora. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, kind of a silly question. I, when you mentioned the strain from Florida, um, saying that the farmers did not observe infection, but when they came. It was a cold day. I thought I heard you say that, and you saw that they were indeed infected. Does temperature play any role in this? Yeah, it's um. So it can provide them a temperature stress. These are tropical animals, so they really can't handle um 
cold weather and uh, they respond to this um, with um, like um, that their uh, mechanisms to counteract the virus infection also weaken due to stress. And if they have uh, some uh, latent pathogens inside them, those can take advantage um, of this. Also insects is um, uh, defense against virus infection is by uh, producing a lot of antiviral peptides, which then uh, starts like a lot of uh, quick um, initiation of, of transcription and uh, replication of cells that are associated with this, which uh, can also provide a very uh, facilitating environment for latent viruses to replicate in them. So um, that's why we think the cold might have triggered that because we had received from the same farm uh, samples constantly before and they consistently tested negative with any PCR methods. So they probably have virus, even if they have this virus latent, then um, it's like at such low yields that even the PCR can't pick it up. But then we sequence the genome even without needing to purify uh, the virus just by extracting DNA directly from the larvae. So it was indeed quite a high titer by the time they made it here. I would like to make a follow-up comment on that. So, so first, regarding the scale of these farms, I was reading a story earlier this week about uh, a hurricane in the Gulf that happened to swamp one of these facilities. And they said they uh, lost 40 million insects in that storm. So that gives you an idea of the scale of how many are growing in co close quarters. Um, for, can you imagine that in one building? And that that's like more than, you know, how many New Yorks is that in, a, in one bin? Uh, secondly, regarding the- um, the the before you go on jason yes uh, it makes pig farming sound po positively palatial yeah <laughs> indeed <laughs> um regarding the reactivation um dr penzesh was doing some cell culture experiments trying to infect cell lines with this virus and got you know some abundant cpe uh, cyto cytopathic effects and then discovered in, in one of these particular lines that it wasn't because the virus was infecting, but because the addition of this exogenous virus, which did not replicate in that particular line, caused latent viruses to reactivate that you know may not have even been apparent that they were there in the line and uh, and actually grow and, and produce virions, which is you know something that that happens with some of these latently infecting viruses. So I wanted to make those two comments to. To, to follow up before we move on to the next question. Um, okay, so I guess this is the next question. Um, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, you mentioned that the um, insects, the yeah, insects with the highest viral titers. Um, I, I'm sorry, the that had the highest that died the fastest rather had the had fairly low viral titers. Mm -hmm. um, do you see? Uh, an up and down effect in that as you increase the viral titer, you get shorter shorter lifespans, but then when you increase it further, the, um, I, I'm, I, say, I said it backwards. When, when you look at those with um, shorter lifespans, you're getting increasing viral loads, but then as you keep going, they dip down again so that the viruses essentially can be begin to accumulate more, but if they accumulate too much, then the if, if they kill the worms too fast, then you just can't reach the viral load because they begin to act too fast, or is it's a lytic pathway turned on that will, because you said they're, they doesn't like a lytic phase. If that gets turned on, will that just kill the worms too fast before the load can increase that much? If you understand yeah. what I'm asking. I think that's exactly what happens because uh, the ones that uh, um, I dosed with like very high uh, virus yields, uh, they uh, not just died the soonest, but also had like overall the lowest uh, viral titers. So it's clear like they, that they um, 
that they killed the animal before they could reach the same titers as the ones um, which got uh, lower initial yields, uh, yields could. Other than that, um, about uh, if there's a drop ever in the titer, we unfortunately don't know because our superworms, by the time they reach these high titers already, exhibit symptoms and they never recover from that. Like once symptoms emerge, then they are gone. There's nothing to do for them. Uh, it's a more interesting question in case of the mealworms and maybe we should look at that, how um, these non-virulent um, strains while they are carrying it, is it for uh, their entire lives or if it shows any fluctuation? Yeah, that we don't know at this point. Are there any questions in the chat or shall we? No, no okay, questions in the well, chat. we have reached um, the the end of our time. So I'd like to invite the students one, one, to one join. Minute. Oh, one, there's one more. Uh, so oh, yes. Um, in recognition of your service, extra service to the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine today, I'm pleased to present you with a, a bunch of PDB swag. Oh, wow, thank you. And you've won a calendar for 2024. <laughs> You've won a deck of playing cards for the um, the game that we designed with uh, the Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center. You match a small molecule structure of a drug to the PDB structure of its target, and not we're not done yet. Um, there's some PDB. There's some PDB propaganda. Of course, is a Thermo Fisher pen, and best of all. You are now the proud owner of uh, our CSB PDB Yeti. Oh, thank you. I, I love these things. I carry my tea in them. Congratulations. On, now, uh, now, you might have to share some of those <laughs> with your husband, who was kind enough to take care of the superworms yeah. <laughs> during some of the experiments. Counting yeah, well, superworms for a month straight. Well, that, what, that, what that shows, as we all know, is that science, biological science, is a team sport. Indeed. Congratulations, Judith. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thank you online. And we'll see you on the 8th of November for a talk about how structural biologists and the PDB played a critical role in taming the the, uh, the global COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Those students who are...